squat, squat. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the Antoine Dupont of website builders. It just never gets old. The Bledisloe Cup is a fixture with more history than Elton Yankees and an entire backroom staff, and more reputation for creating drama than Elton Yankees and an entire backroom staff, and yet every year it catches us as if for the first time. This fir Thursday, yeah that's the first, gave us a match for the ages. Think the Millennium's game they played in heaven with a twisty turny backstab ending written by William Bloody Shakespeare and you're halfway there. Australia haven't held the Bledisloe Cup since the names Len, Pete and Bernard were in fashion but my god did they come close this week only to be denied by one of the most unique refereeing calls you'll ever see and the dramatic incredible composure of New Zealand to slide the years back to prime heartbreak o'clock. So, how did the tussle swing so violently in either direction, and what does this tell us about the two teams with one round remaining of the best and tightest rugby championship there's ever been? The last year for the All Blacks has been, all in all, pretty bloody wild. The only thing that seems to change as often as the letter in their results column is the game plan they're deploying to achieve it. Besides seemingly adopting three or four completely different philosophies on the game over this tournament, never mind sets of individual tactics. Yet, I feel like the last two rounds I've begun to understand what these shifts in style are about, what they're trying to achieve, especially when put in context of their new attack coach. Back in the days where quarterfinal exit wouldn't be disappointing for him, Joe Schmidt's side usually went into every game with the same kicking tactics, same shape and structures, but would identify one or two, and it usually was just one or two. Opposition weaknesses, things they do to try and catch out over and over and over and over again during the game. We saw it in, say, their iconic win in Chicago over his new team, where they stressed the fringe of the ruck over and over and over again, but also in matches such as the loss to Japan, Ireland created two tries early on using the same tactics, trying to exploit how their fullback defends in the 22, but suddenly struggled to convert pressure into points once Japan fixed the problem after 20 minutes. Suddenly, they're out of ideas. And so, with the All Blacks, Schmidt clearly identified a weakness or two with every team in this championship, and is making his teams lean into them hard each week. With South Africa, it was how off guard they can be caught by the ball being kept alive all the time. The charges out of the 22, breakaways, constant offloading to keep the pace up, really worked. Against Argentina, it was these short passes. The Pumas play a defence that trusts individuals to hunt out big shots or drift onto the next guy if that's not on, and by overloading them, they were able to open up tiny gaps between players to create these kind of breakthroughs. And against Australia, they noticed something that came up in their very first attack of the game. The Wallaby defence feeds on big hits and great line speed. It's a D that wants to disrupt you soon rather than holding you until later, and as such, in every zone, the Wallabies defend with their scrum half, be it White, McDermott or this week Gordon, in the main defensive line instead of behind as an old school sweeper, often deployed as a sniper to apply pressure. Now, a chip over rush defence is the, just the oldest trick in the book, but Schmidt and Foster had two neat little tricks to adapt to the Wallabies' particular solutions for this problem. Across most of the pitch, Rainey's Rascals, as I dare a commentator to call them next week, deploys the fly half as a kind of half fullback, central and able to advance to cover the kick. That's what Havili spots here. This chip gets in behind the winger, and because Foley's in the middle of the backfield, he can't get to the ball in time. Australia's other workaround for chip kicks is having the blindside winger, sat deeper, work inwards, and in the 22, the fly half defends in the main line, so covering the chip is solely on the winger. And this is what they try to exploit here. Havili dropping onto the boot instantly to try and hit this space, knowing it's beyond where even Coro and Bette can reach in time. However, Tom Wright does a brilliant job of just being an annoying little prick. He gets in the way and means Moonga can't take it on the full, and then Coro and Bette is in the way by now, so a hack on is no longer an option. The first few years under Foster, NZ essentially just looked to get the best players into places where they could pull game-breaking moments. There wasn't a system designed to break teams down per se, just to kind of hold shape until the moments presented themselves. But what we've started to see over the last month is a kind of middle ground system between that and an island-style approach where they build and script out moments where the defence will be weaker. However, this system is something they're still getting used to, and we can see that here. Geordie Barrett takes it in, and New Zealand clear out and then carry again just to set position, so the chip will be eventually in the perfect place. Except, the free runners off Moonga here are so flat on each other, they essentially are one option instead of three, meaning Liotta alone can mark all of them, because only one of them can receive the ball, they can't really pass to each other. And instead of standing in the boot, Havili is wider out. If he was stood behind, here, his chase likely wouldn't be as good, but Ikitao would be watching him and have to push forward on to try and mark him. Instead, it's clear the only options available to Moonga are either a pass, 
to one of these three forwards, or a kick, or he's going to kick it. And it means only Liotta has to rush up. Ikitao and Koro and Bete can drop backwards, and Foley can come forwards to mark it easily. This whole setup is way too artificial. It's straight off the training park, but not in a good way at all. It's so pre-called, the players' roles aren't actually believable. Foster knew at half-time he had to fix this. And if there's one thing we know about Ian Foster, is that that man loves Squarespace. And so, heading to the website he first built to secure a job a month ago, Foster could easily add a new page to do just the opposite. He posted a job ad. It was so easy to put together. An acting teacher required to train New Zealand All Blacks. And because Squarespace is so quick and easy to use, yet produces such beautiful results so simply, he's able to create the page and format it and get it to fit its requirements and then share it easily all over so quickly that Robert De Niro had answered just four minutes after Foster first headed to squarespace.com. And... If you want to do the same, you know, create a website, then down the line, Honeypot Al Pacino to help you under eight's team, head to the link in the description and use the offer code Squid Rugby to save yourself some money on that gorgeous website that you're going to, you're going to do it. You're going to go and build that website. You're going to do it now. Just as when the second half came around, instead of being purely artificial, the All Blacks were able to method the hell out of their new tactics, constructing a setup to exploit space without forcing the play. With Jake Gordon in the bin, Australia bring microscopic urine child Nick White on with key defender Lenny Kitao temporarily off. This makes a lot of sense. Whilst the 9 is a unique position in attack, in D for Australia, their role is almost identical to the 13s. They're kind of a second 13. So, for now, they're only losing a body rather than a role in the system. And so, New Zealand know, in order to best exploit the space Schmidt highlighted in the week, they need to apply as much stress to it as possible. After a couple of phases, Bowden hangs this kick. Many often wonder, when you play right, why do you ever kick it? But the Wallabies are essentially missing a winger, with Coran Bete stood in Ikitao's usual position in the 13 here, and it means he has to backtrack onto the ball. Now, any coach will tell you, you always want to come forward onto a high ball, so Callaway pelts forwards to take it, but it's way too far forwards, and Will Jordan can catch it almost uncontested. Not only has this game New Zealand 30 metres, it's pulled the Aussie back free horrendously out of shape. As they begin to play wide, Foley is the only man in the backfield, and Callaway is still getting up to his feet. New Zealand work right out to the touchline and force Tom Wright to make the tackle. As they play a phase in field, Will Jordan spots something and makes the call to Barrett. Normally, Australia have one winger deeper, meaning Foley can cover central, Callaway covers the other side, but with Wright forced to make the tackle, Coro and Bette filling in at 13 temporarily moments earlier, and Callaway recently on the floor, there's no one. And crucially, Will Jordan hides himself in the boot here. Jordan is a genuine ball player. He loves to pass. He can distribute. And they think he might be slotting in as a distributor. And that means White here, normally the man who would turn and cover it, has to fly up to try and mark Jordan. If this is Caleb Clark instead of Jordan, White probably staggers himself to cover. But instead, Bodie makes a beauty. And with no central defender, Jordan can take it perfectly. And Callaway's pulling across so far from the far wing, having only been getting up onto his feet moments earlier, it's easy to step him and for Jordan to glide under the post. It's a brilliant finish, a brilliant call, and shows utterly brilliant discipline by the All Blacks, pulling players who might be able to cover that chip slowly out of the picture, reducing the numbers in the backfield, and taking away their time to think about where they're going to be, and then beautiful timing by Jordan to know exactly when to pull the play. However, if there's one thing this Wallaby team can do, it's strike the hell back. And they did it first through the phenomenal Rob Valentini, who had one of the best games of his career on Thursday. His work at the breakdown is brilliant, in contact he's exceptional, his game awareness to stab through this kick for Coro and Bete to chase is next level and the finish on this try whoa, whoa. sometimes right you look at the try and all the nancy you've got to do is go yeah that lad's bloody good he's bloody good isn't he look at him he should be stop static on the game line here but no he powers through and scores bloody good really big really good and the line out that followed valentini's quick thinking toe poke very almost results in the try itself as the Wallabies rumble forwards, they entirely segregate the forwards from the backs aside from Coro and Bete, both units trusting the other to do their job. Eventually, Gordon uses Fichetti, who does a little jig on the left-hand side, but his whole role really is to just set a position for them to pull a strike play from that side of the pitch. Philip is already in position to make a really positive carry, and the Wallabies can all slot in around each other. Holloway volunteers to carry once more while the backs refine their shape, but just take a look at Bernard Foley. Having just rocked over, he anticipates Ikatao, now in Holloway's boot, calling for the ball. Clark buys in on Ikatao, but Foley has essentially created an extra line of attack for the All Blacks to worry about, and this turns it into a free on two. Slipper briefly squares up to try and distract Ioani, but Foley keeps his eyes on Barrett to draw him and set Callaway free. It's genius by Foley, all on the fly. 
However, after being distracted by Slipper, Yoani breezes past Foley and makes a brilliant just triple effort in order to get onto Kellaway. He ultimately holds himself up here, but it'd be an easy score if not for the incredible work rate of Yoani. The first try he actually does finish, however, is unbelievably old school. It's a kind of play that largely died out of the game. Very few tens would ever even attempt what Foley goes for here, be coached out of them, because, you know, the 5 foot 10 fly half runs straight at the All Blacks two hardest hitting forwards and can squeeze between them to free an arm. People talk of chip kicks or grubbers or risky offloads as low percentage plays, but in the modern age, with only a fullback to clear out, this is even lower. Yet Foley's 2015 brain goes for it and it really pays off, it works. And now, back in the game, Australia can kick on. And ironically, the try that follows, also scored by Callaway, is exactly the kind of score the All Blacks were reliant on for the last few years. It's a really simple play, looking to get their best try score into a bit of space, hoping for an opposition error. The moment this maul halts, White hits Fiketti, who has Ikatao running a superb hardline here. He's believably an option until now, where he stops his momentum in order to bump Yoani and prevent him drifting, as he did on that Callaway opportunity in the first half. This leaves two players in midfield. Mawanga has shot up on his opposite number, but Caleb Clark... Okay, right, look. Caleb Clark is an absolutely unbelievable world-class talent with the ball in hand, but the rest of his game, on the evidence of this year's rugby championship, is simply not up to international level. His positioning is average, his kick chase, frankly atrocious, his decision making with the ball often leaves a lot to be desired, but the big issue, the really big problem, is his decision making without the ball. He's now cost New Zealand at least one try in four of the five games he started this season, so Australia run a move specifically to make him think, knowing he's most likely going to make a bad decision, and unlike Ioane earlier, not be able to make up for it, because he rarely does, he's quite slow at turning afterwards. Coro and Betty wraps around Foley here, who's been bought a second by a Katao's line, and Clark is paying so much attention to his opposite number, he completely ignores Callaway on the outside. But he also doesn't really pressure Coro and Bete, just putting himself in no man's land. This allows the fullback to drift around him and just wait for Barrett to commit. He doesn't, trusting his inside man to catch the ball carrier, so Callaway goes himself. It's a perfect finish, it's, it's superb. But if Clark does notice Callaway, Australia are hoping it plants enough doubt in his mind that he can separate from Mawanga long enough for Foley to put Coran Bete through the gap and under the post. It's sharp contrast, frankly, to the man frequently filling that channel for Australia and the one destined to soon take the crown of most underrated player on the planet if we don't start talking about the bugger real soon. It's Len Iketau, a hard-running piston of a player on attack. It's in D that the centre really shines. This is whilst Australia down to 13 men, right? New Zealand have a turnover ball, an opportunity with an overlap, inside the 22. He covers the ground so smoothly, he can mark three players. Ioane, thinking he's drawn in, but instead chucking a hospital ball to Bodhi, who has his eyes on Iketau the whole time, knowing he has to cut inside, because if he doesn't, there's a solid chance Iketau is smashing Jordan, the fourth attack he'd be covering, into touch. He's just a brilliant defensive centre and was incredibly influential in keeping the All Blacks at bay during that two-man power play. Knowing how good he is, Dave Rennie essentially asked him to play three positions at once, the kind of drifting defence you just saw being utilised to let him play centre and wing at the same time without the ball, as well as filling in a flanker's role on attack. And indeed, the seven points New Zealand did score in that period came because they managed to use that originally identified strength to get around him. This is gorgeous by the All Blacks. Instead of the traditional cross kick off 10, they go one in and force the Aussie defence up. And with their reduced numbers and need for a heavy backfield, Ikatao is the only back covering four Kiwis. And as Barrett shapes the kick, the assumption is he's clearing the ball. This is his own 22, after all. These two tiny decisions mean Ikatao has to consider which of the four rows he's going to fill, and whilst he can't shut down anything further by Jordan, this has also brought Foley up once again, and means he can stick it on the toe and leave Callaway, once again covering from the far wing, to regather the ball only after it's bounced a few times, putting him under immense pressure. But, where the All Blacks have Hoskins Satutu on the charge, Australia only have scrum off Gordon, and it means, once the cavalry has arrived, Satutu can drive upwards. This makes it impossible for Australia to seal the ball, they're being driven up. They can't get over it. They can't get the body shape right. And Satutu's fellow forwards drive in to push over the ball and turn it over. It's excellent. It's something Satutu is really outstanding at. Keep an eye on him in this passage, right? He repeatedly goes to block, bump, or generally jackal assist. But with Sam Kane off the park and Ardi Surveyor not playing, he's not got anybody to enter for him and take the opportunities he's creating. However, having filled four jobs already, Ikatao has stepped in to play scrum R for fifth job with Gordon on the floor and it leaves him part of this ruck once the ball is away at the sixth job, meaning he isn't in position to pull his trick and defend in the centres again. But what he gets in response is outstanding by the all-black forwards. They set to shape unbelievably quickly. This is a free pod set instantly with hip-boot options and wide men abound. 
However, most impressive is Ethan de Groot, who is brilliant. Recognising this shape requires someone to run it, he slides out from his usual position to play fly half, and doesn't fall into any of the usual traps. He just slings the ball out early. Too many non-regular tens will try to engage a defender here, but it would just allow these Australian defenders to drift and eat up the space. Instead, he throws a simple ball and hence creates a 5 on 2. And, well, if you play rugby at any level, take note of not just the value of De Groot's early ball, but Brody Retallick's line here. Fiketti tries to lay a trap for him here, huge amounts of space so that Fiketti knows he can close off quickly, he can kind of shut down. Too many rugby players, never mind locks, would see that and either crash it up themselves, try and take that space, or keep drifting towards the touchline because that's where they'll be able to keep going the most, that's where the most space is. Instead, Rotalic drifts inwards and waits for Fiketti's shoulder to turn for him to start to close that gap and delivers the pass to Takiyaho, who hits the line straight and doesn't commit to an option either until the defenders have. Valentini has simply too many men out here for him to mark that he can't afford to commit to him, and it allows Takiyaho to crash over for his second try of the game. The first might be different, but it's no less impressive. New Zealand win the line out and immediately identify Jed Holloway as the biggest threat in the Australian counter drive. De Groot wastes no time and steps into him, grapples him, and just makes a real nuisance of himself. Holloway was originally aiming to sneak around Retallick, but now he has a six foot three prop in his way. This opens up a gap in the middle of the mall, which is immediately filled by Sam Whitelock and Alan Alalatoa. Now, Alalatoa does an excellent job of neutralising the initial drive here, but Whitelock sinks into a hole in the mall, meaning Alalatoa now has to tackle the larger frame of his back, which, spoiler alert, is harder to shunt than his leg. Whitelock uses his back to push Alalatoa upwards, meaning Australia's other biggest threat is now entirely upright. With these two out of the game, all the All Blacks need is an extra bit of meat to shove them forwards. Now, the laws state the backs can only pile in once the more passes the 15 or 5 metre lines, and the All Blacks only start crabbing sideways once they know they've got the key Aussie threats out of the way. It's incredibly smart and allows for the bonus beef to get in and get Takiyaho over the line. And yet, it was the corresponding corner where the drama really started. I think, above the result or the tries that'll be scored, what we all really want to see from a Bledisloe Cup match, at least speaking as a neutral, is a moment. A moment of pure drama and holy shit shouting. A moment that'll define the game as the Bledisloe Cup match where, for decades to come. And the final five minutes of this game gave us five. This was the game where Australia came back from the wrong end of a palindronic scoreline, 16 points down, to draw level. This was the game where Nick White stepped up to nail a hell of a pelt from halfway, cool as you like. This was the game where Lalakai Fagetti, on just his second start, secured the match-saving turnover on his own try line. But then, we got the two we'll really remember. This was the game where Geordie Barrett scored in the corner at the death. And this was the game where Mathieu Reynal made one of the most controversial calls in the fixture's history. Here's the thing though, right? There have been some mad reports that this moment ruined the game, that we're now wrong for enjoying it. And coming from a Wallaby fan who's desperate to win the hilarity Overside Cup that it feels like they haven't held since the old bloke it was named after, who I haven't checked was probably super racist, you know, rugby union, so it's, it's, it's likely, was alive, I get it. But this call isn't wrong. It's controversial. It's bizarre, odd, uncanny and unlikely, but it's not incorrect. I've never seen anything like it, but, you know, it's fair enough. And at the end of the day, the thing that keeps us glued to this fixture, year after year, game after game, even when one side hasn't won a series in two decades, is that drama like this can spring up at any turn, any moment, in any game. It's the hardest to believe refereeing decision we'll see all year. And that chaos, that unpredictability, and that moment that'll always make this the game where Foley couldn't kick it in time is just what makes the Bledisloe Cup so special. Yeah, I think it's going to come down um, to the nitty-gritty of, nitty of footy in, 